Greetings, brethren, and welcome to this Sabbath for the 21st day of June, 2014, on the pagan Roman calendar, the 23rd day of the third month on God's sacred calendar, the Hebrew calendar. That means the next holy day and the seventh month is a good at least three months away. Just giving you a little indication of where we are in time. And friends, we're going to go right into our sermon this morning, the last half hour of a sermon given by Mr. Herbert W. Armstrong in Big Sandy on August 22, 1981, entitled, We Are the Temple. We, meaning you, me, the, the church, the members of the body of Jesus Christ. We are the temple. And at the end of Mr. Armstrong's sermon, I'll come back and be discussing some email I got, a video I got on uh, Red Heifer, and the whole subject of whether what Mr. Armstrong says in this sermon about looking for Christ will be returning to a spiritual temple. We'll discuss whether what he said in this sermon and several others like this, whether that renunciates what he said in writings in 1967 and 1968 about our looking for a physical temple for the purpose of certain scriptures in the New Testament even, prophecies calling for us to be watching for that temple and daily sacrifices set up in that temple and then being taken away and, a, and an abomination of desolation being set up there to trigger off a certain certain counts that we're to be watching for. We'll discuss that. So I'll just put that on the table for you to be um, aware of what we'll go into after Mr. Armstrong's sermon, the last half hour here from August 22nd, 1981. We are the temple. Here's Mr. Armstrong with that sermon. Jesus came and he said in Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church. Now, no one that has the Holy Spirit yet. And Christ came and said, I will build my church. But in Joel 2, 28, Joel 2, 28, the prophet said this, and it shall come to pass afterward, I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. Oh, God shut up the Holy Spirit, as I read to you, in the time of Adam, and drove Adam out of the Garden of Eden, but now he's going to pour out his Spirit upon all flesh. Who will? All who will accept it. Well, but Jesus decided that the time had not come, and God Almighty decided the time has not come for all flesh, just part of all flesh now. So Jesus said, I am come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. And I mean life, not temporary existence. But he also said, John 6, 44. John 6, 44. I want to read that. I want to read that. John 6, 44. I want you to know I'm reading this out of the Bible. Jesus said, No man can come to me. Uh-oh. No man. Is this the day of salvation? No man can come to me, except the Father which sent me draw him. Now, my God draws a lot of their cause, but only a few are chosen. And you know, to one of the churches, the church up at Ephesus, you read in the first chapter of Ephesus how the Apostle Paul said, God has chosen you. You were called, they had accepted, and they were chosen. But he said, Jesus had said, no one can come to me even now except the few God has predestinated and called. Brethren, if you have been called, you are one of the few who have been called and chosen. Around you are hundreds of others, around every one of you, who have not been called. Now, are you better than they? Is God playing favorites? Not a bit. You have to fight Satan the devil. You have to live in a world that is going Satan's way. It's Satan's world. You have to, well, you know, any old dead fish can float down the stream and take a pretty live fish, like uh, salmon, for example, to swim up against the swift current. We've got to swim up against the swift current. We've got to go against the world. 
We've got to be persecuted by the world. We have to come out of the world and be separate. You know, when God opens up the Holy Spirit to all flesh, and he will beginning in Christ's coming to all flesh and living, there won't be any devil around any longer. And the whole world will be as full of the knowledge of the Lord as the ocean beds are covered with water. You don't live in that kind of world. You and I have got it a lot harder. But we, if we overcome, he says, Genesis 2, verses uh, 26 and 27, and Gen uh, I mean, Revelation 2, 26 and 21. Revelation 2, verses 26 and 27. And Revelation 3, verse 21. If you overcome, you will be able to sit with Christ in his throne. If we overcome, we will be given power to rule the nations and help convert and save the nation in the millennium. Now, others coming later don't have that promise. I don't know whether God decided to give it to him later, but he hasn't yet. That promise only applies to those in the church now. It does not apply to others that will be uh, called later. Now, finally, in the millennium, and then in the right great white throne judgment, God will pour out his Spirit upon all flesh. But now he's just calling a few in the church. We are the first fruits. That's what the day of Pentecost means. Now, God gave us the feast day. The first is the Passover, the slain Christ. That's the beginning toward spiritual salvation to the second Adam, toward eternal life, which Adam turned down. He didn't take the tree of life. The second festival of the days of unleavened bread, we have to quit sinning and come out of sin. The third festival is in the summer, the feast of Pentecost, meaning the feast of first fruits, that we are just the first of salvation. Just a few are offered the Holy Spirit and the tree of life now. The general world around you, your next door neighbors probably are not offered the tree of life. You have been. What a wonderful thing. Don't let it slip. Don't let it slip. But Joel said the time will come when he will pour out his spirit upon all flesh. Now on the day of Pentecost, that spirit was poured out upon the beginning, the first fruit of those God was calling that were predestinated. And in Acts, the second chapter, and in verses 15 to 17, you will find that Peter said that on that day of Pentecost, that this was what Joel had prophesied, that the beginning of pouring out the Spirit of God upon all flesh. And no longer was the Spirit of God completely shut up from everybody. But listen, brethren, the churches that call Christians think that salvation has always been offered to everybody. It has not. Something was not offered to people. Well, then what? They will be resurrected in the great white throne judgment, and then it will be offered to them. But it was not offered to them in this life. It is offered to you and me now. Does that mean something to you? What a wonderful opportunity. But we have to fight off Satan and Satan's people this world. A very great thing. All right, that's the church. Now, the church had the, 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 the commandments of God. The church got its teaching from the original apostles. And the original apostles got their teaching direct from Christ, the second Adam. And the church started off with glory and all of that, but it didn't, all that glory didn't last too long. You notice in the book of Galatians, in the first chapter, verse 6, Paul wrote, now this was in about 53 A.D., to 1 A.D. It's about 22 years later, 21 or 22 years later, the church is just of age. And Paul says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. They began right then to suppress the gospel of Christ. The gospel is the message Christ brought. It's the good news of the kingdom of God, that you can be born into the kingdom of God. But we have to, oh, the kingdom of God is the government of God and the family of God, ruling the government of God. And every government is based on a constitution or a basic law. And the basic law or constitution of God's government is the law of love the Ten Commandments.
And now that was not preached any longer, the kingdom of God. And instead, the great false church came, Babylon the Great, and later came the Reformation called the Protestant Reformation. And the Bible says they are the harlots of a false religion, the old Babylonian mystery religion of superstition. However, the true church did survive. But what happened to the true church? The original church got a teaching from the apostles in the same generation just immediately after they got it from Jesus Christ. But where did the third generation of the church get it? They had to get it from the people of the second generation. By that time, the apostles were all dead. Now, let me tell you something. If you start a game that I used to play when I was young called the whispering game, and here's a gentleman over here, and if he whispers to the lady next to him a certain, about ten words in a sentence, and she listens, and then he may repeat it again. Yeah, all right, she understands it. So now she whispers it to the lady next to her. And that lady hears it, or what she thinks she hears, and she whispers it to the lady next to her, and she whispers it to the person next to her, and so on. So we get down to the other end of the line. And then the one at the end of the line says, what, what sentence did you hear? And he gets up and says it doesn't make any sense at all. And they say to the first gentleman here, what was what did you whisper the first woman? And it's altogether different. And you see, from one getting it from the other, it got all mixed up. You know, I try that sometimes. And you'll see that when people get it from other people, they get it all mixed up. It's just like rumors going around. You hear a rumor. You tell it. But you have to add a little something. You take away something. You have to change it a little bit. And the other person here, oh, they got to go tell someone else about that rumor about somebody, against somebody. But they change it a little bit. And finally, about the fourth or fifth time, that rumor, you can't recognize it as the way it started out. Well, that's what happened to true church. When I came among the true church back in 1926 and 27, the church had lost about all of the original truth, except that there is some kind of salvation through Christ and they knew we must have the law of God, especially the Sabbath. They were keeping the Sabbath, and they had the name Church of God. But they lost all sense of what was the gospel. They didn't know about the kingdom of God. They didn't know. They knew there would be a millennium, and that Christ would rule, and it would be on earth. But they didn't know what would happen in the millennium. They didn't know what it would be like. They didn't know of any government of God. They didn't know we could be born in the family of God. They didn't know what salvation really was, really is. They had lost most of these things. They had lost all of the holy days and the annual Sabbath. They had lost all of that. God revealed it to me, and when I preached it to them, they laughed me to scorn. They wouldn't have anything to do with it. They received so much information, so much knowledge, they wouldn't receive any more. Would you receive additional knowledge? I'm giving you some additional knowledge to most of you today. Are you going to receive it? Or won't you receive it? Well, now, you know, let's get back to our own time. Matthew 24. That's the greatest prophecy in the New Testament, the prophecy of Jesus. They lost the true gospel. And Jesus said, he was upon the Mount of Olives, and the disciples came to him privately, and they asked him, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming at the end of the world? What things did they mean? they have been talking about the temple being destroyed, and uh, uh, that was going to happen in their lifetime. So Jesus started by telling what had happened in their lifetime. He said, Many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and shall deceive many. Now, be careful you don't get deceived. You're going to find many who come preaching a false gospel. The gospel is going to be suppressed. The gospel is the kingdom of God. They began to preach the gospel about Christ, and not about the message of Christ. They preached about the messenger, but they left out the messenger's message. So, finally, it would come down to the time of the end. And finally, in verse 14, this gospel of the kingdom, that's the gospel Jesus preached, 
Calvary preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end of this church age, the end of this time, this present world come. Brethren, did you ever hear the gospel of the kingdom till you heard it through this church? And the early members of this church never heard it except through my voice. And you either heard it through me or indirectly from me, but others who did hear it from me. Every one of you. The gospel of the kingdom of God had not been preached before. Now it has been preached ever since 1936. 33. I went on the air first in the fall, in October 1933, but that was only just one one week. But the program started January, the first Sunday in January 1934, and has been going on ever since. And by the way, we're going on a lot more radio stations now, we're going to speak once again. Anyway, we're getting down to the very time of the end now. I want you to notice something. In Ephesians 2 and verse 20, in the talking of the church, it says the church is built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Now that means the prophets of the Old Testament and the prophets of, and the apostles of the New. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building, now the church is compared to a building. Not a lot of different buildings. One building. It's the body of Christ. Christ is the head of it. How many bodies does Christ have? You know that the prophet Daniel, I'm going to write an article on this for you, you'll read it a little later. Daniel had a vision in which he saw a funny kind of a beast, a wild animal, but it had four heads. Now it was just symbolic of the Greco Macedonian Empire. That's in the seventh chapter of the book of Daniel. A beast that had four different heads. I never saw one. But did you ever see four different beasts that all had just one head and had four different beasts under that one head? I never did. There are not a lot of churches, and Christ is, has only the one body. And the body is compared to the human body in the 12th chapter of 1 Corinthians. I tell you, you cut off even a part of a little finger or a part of a little throat. This church, that person is no longer part of the body. There is only one body of Christ. There is only one church, and it's compared to a building. A lot of churches and a lot of bodies here and there, each one in confusion, speaking something different. I know someone very well who says the church is like a lot of electric light bulbs here and there, but they all get the current from the same place, but one lights up one light and another another kind of light. So we have a lot of churches, one speaks one thing and another another, and they all speak different things. But Christ the head of them all? No. Christ is not the head of that kind of a thing. He's the head of one body. The church is one body. Many members, but the one body. Ephesians, I mean, 1 Corinthians 12 chapter. One body. And here it's compared to a building. In whom all the buildings simply framed together, not all scattered apart, part of it here and part of it over in some other town, part in another part of the world, all together grow up, up into a holy temple in the Lord. It is now a temple. That's the kind of a building. We, my brethren, are the temple to which Christ is coming at the second coming. Everybody wonders, well, what kind of a temple is he coming to? Christ is coming to the temple of his own body, the church. He's coming to marry the church, and the church will have made herself ready without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, not different churches speaking different things. The church in Ephesians, uh, uh, 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, must all speak the same thing, not one speaking this thing or someone else speaking a different thing and saying, well, we're all hanging on to Christ some way or other. You can't do that. Christ is the vine, and we are the branches. But did you ever see grapes being produced on a branch that is cut off from the vine? He said, we must bear much fruit, but you have to be on, on to the vine, and the vine is organized together. It's one vine. It's not several vines scattered around. 
There's only the one church, and it is the temple to which Christ is coming. Oh, what a different spirit again now in the church. What a different spirit in Pasadena. What a different spirit here in Big Sandy. It's like it once was years ago. And that spirit of contention, that spirit of wanting to compromise with Satan is all gone. Now then, we are the temple to which Christ is coming. All right, now I'd like to have you turn back, if you will, to Malachi. Malachi, the third chapter. Here is a prophecy. You've you've heard it before. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple. What temple is he coming to? The church. He's coming to the church at the second coming. Even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in, behold, he shall come, says the Lord of hosts. Now, what coming is he talking about? Let's go on and read. But who may abide the day of his coming, and who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap at this coming. And he shall sit as a refiner of, and a purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi. Did he do that when Jesus came before? When he began preaching in 27 AD? Oh no, he didn't do that then. He's going to do that in his second coming. And he will purge them as gold and silver, and that they may offer unto the uh, Lord an offering in righteousness. And then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord. Did that happen when he came before? Not at all. Jerusalem was in the charge of the Romans, and the Romans were using the Jewish Pharisees and the Sadducees in their government, and they were fighting Christ. They weren't purified. No. Then shall the offering be uh, of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord, as in the days of old, as in former years. And I will come near unto you to judgment. Judgment is not coming till the beginning of the millennium, when he comes a second time. I will come near to you to judgment. And I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, and against the false swearers, and against those that oppress the hireling in his wages, and the widow, and uh, the fatherless, and uh, uh, that turn aside uh, the stranger from uh, the right, and fear not me, says the Lord of hosts. That is talking about the second coming, and someone coming to prepare the way before the second coming. And yet you will read in Mark, the first chapter, that John the Baptist came to prepare the way before the coming of Christ. That was his first coming. You know, some of them asked, Christ was John the Baptist Elijah. Oh, they asked John the Baptist if he was Elijah. John the Baptist said, no, I'm not, and he was not Elijah. But uh, they said to Christ that we thought Elijah was to come. Well, he says, Elijah has come. Elijah has come. And he's speaking about John the Baptist. But in another place, he said that John the Baptist was only another man, but in the power and spirit of Elijah. Elijah had come in the person of John the Baptist. The best prophecy was talking about someone coming to prepare the way for the second coming and to prepare the church to be ready for Christ's coming, to be the bride to be called up to meet him in the air. And you people are that bride. What is your Bible talking about, brethren? It's about time we open our understanding and that we get to understand who and what we are. He's talking about someone coming to prepare the way for the second coming of Christ. But John the Baptist was a voice crying out in the physical wilderness of the Jordan River. This is talking about someone coming, a voice crying out in the midst of the spiritual wilderness of Babylon, confusion, and calling people out of Babylon. 
John the Baptist came to repair the way for a physical Jesus. Someone else is going to come preparing the way for a spiritual Christ in power and great glory to come to rule. John the Baptist prepared the way for a physical Jesus to come to a physical people, his own people Judah, who received him not. This time, someone is preparing the way for Christ to come as a great spiritual King of kings and Lord of lords and power and glory to meet his spiritual temple, the church, that will be caught up in the air, taken, translated from mortal to immortal, becoming very God of his bride to the marriage. He's coming to his spiritual temple. The first time he came to a physical temple built of stone and wood and material. The second time he's coming to a spiritual temple composed of spirit because this church is going to be changed from matter. You won't be in a physical body. You won't have a heart pumping blood. You will become spirit. You are that temple, brethren. Do you know who you are? Now I'd like to turn to another prophecy. My theory is Haggai. Chapter 2, Haggai, a prophet. He says, Speak now to Zerubbabel. Now Zerubbabel, this was a governor of a colony sent down to Jerusalem seven years after Judah had been captured, the temple of Solomon had been destroyed in Jerusalem, and 70 years later, to fulfill a prophecy by Jeremiah, a colony of Jews was sent back down there. And they were all Jews, not any of the lost tribes of House of Israel were in that colony. The Rubbabel was the governor, and he was sent there to build the temple, the second temple to which Christ was going to come the first time. He was the one John the Baptist was the one who prepared the way for Christ's first coming. Here it was Zerubbabel, the one to prepare the temple to which Christ was coming the first time. Now I want you to get the similarity, the duality of this whole thing. And Christ was saying, verse 3, Who is left among you that saw this house, that was Solomon's temple, in her first glory? Probably the most when the period is we never built in the history of the world. And how do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes as uh, in comparison of it as nothing? And yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, saith the Lord, and Joshua, the high priest, saith the Lord, and work, for I am with you, saith the Lord of hosts, and build this temple. Now that temple was a type of the temple to which Christ is coming the second time. According as the word that I have covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, Spirit remaineth among you, fear ye not. For thus says the eternal of hosts, yet once it is a little while, and I will. Now he's going into a prophecy way into the future. Now notice this, the prophecy it hasn't even happened yet in our time. And I will shake the heavens and the earth, and the sea, and the dry land, and I will shake all nations. He's just starting to do that now. Do you know that I have been visiting the heads of nations all over this world, and many of those heads of nations that I have visited in the last ten years are now dead and overthrown and gone, and nations and the thrones of nations have been overthrown at the rate of about one a month part of the time? Many every year, all over this world, I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. They were building the second temple. The silver and gold is mine, is mine, and the gold is mine, says the eternal of hosts. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than of the former, greater glory than of Solomon's temple. Oh, oh. The temple that uh, the Zerubbabel built was not anywhere near as glorious as the Solomon Temple. It is speaking by type of the temple that is to be built at Christ's coming. It will be more glorious than Solomon's Temple. Brethren, you were that temple. You were not yet glorified. You're just sitting here in flesh and blood. Some of you part sickly with certain diseases. 
Oh, you'll be all healed. You'll be raised up in the sky and the clouds to meet Christ that is coming. You'll be changed from matter into spirit. You will be glorified. Much more glorious than Solomon's temple to which he's referring here. And in this place will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. That's in Jerusalem, where they were. Now, there's never been peace in Jerusalem from that time on, but there will be. Who is preparing the way for the second temple? Through whom? God works through him and being through whom is he building the second temple? Where is the voice crying out? Prepare the way. The gospel was a no. The gospel was sabotaged. It was not preached. For 100 time cycles of 1900 years. Through whom did God begin preaching that gospel? The gospel of the kingdom of God in Europe, to all the United States, to the kings of the world all over this earth. Who? It came out of this church, brethren. This church is mightier than you realize. Very much so. We're in the last days preparing for the second coming of Christ, and we better get our house in order. Because Christ wants this church presented to him, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Revelation 19 says, His bride will have made herself ready. We've been getting ready now for two and a half, three years. Are we yet ready? I think not quite. But we're a lot nearer ready than we were three years ago. We've got to pray harder. We've got to read our Bibles more. We've got to have our minds on the thing of God and get our minds off of the things of this world and its entertainment. We've got to get back to God. We've got to get prepared and be ready for the second coming of Christ. Because we're not quite ready yet. He that has an ear, let him hear what Jesus Christ spoke to you today through his servants and his apostles. Thank you, brethren. I hope that you get the message. Okay, friends, Mr. Armstrong with an outstanding message from August 22nd, 1981 entitled, We Are the Temple. Now, I wanted to play that sermon today because, let me see if I can get this switched over here, and I have to resize this. Bear with me just a moment, friends. Let me hit a couple buttons that'll open up some slides so I can put some scriptures up on the screen for you. Let's see, this, maybe this will do it right here. Yes, all right. Now, move this out of the way. Um, okay, now that, that was the sermon of the, uh, the title of the sermon that, that you just heard. And uh, it's, we just took the last half hour of this sermon entitled, We Are the Temple by Mr. Herbert W. Armstrong. Again, given in Big Sandy on August 22nd, 1981. And he, he gave, even last week, we played a sermon entitled, we played the whole sermon of a sermon entitled Zerubbabel, uh, the Temple of Zerubbabel. And Mr. Armstrong is emphasizing and making the point that Christ is returning to a spiritual temple. He's not returning to a physical temple. And yet the question still remains and needs to be answered. Uh, and I want to read an email to you, so bear with me one more moment while I, to play the tape, I had to have the audio set up on this other computer. And I want to switch this computer now so I can put on my uh, teleprompter, I can put a couple of emails that I received. Yeah, good, got it. Okay, now, um, 
the question remains, brethren, whether Christ, uh, well, I asked that question already, whether Christ is returning to a spiritual temple or a physical temple. Mr. Armstrong has answered that for us. He's returning to a spiritual temple. But then that leads to the question, okay, well, what about the need for a physical temple at the end of time that Mr. Armstrong wrote in 1967 and 1968 would be the signal for the counting. Uh, I'll come back around to those questions. I just want to put them on the table up front. Now, it may be that the Jewish religions of the Jewish people who reside in Israel and Jerusalem today, they may utilize a red heifer, even the recent one from a YouTube video that some people have been uh, viewing and sharing with others on on um, social media like Facebook. And I want to thank you for sharing, for um, those who shared that with me. And um, we'll talk about that. I sent notes related to that to a friend of mine who works in, uh, who work, who, well, doesn't work there anymore. Of course, the whole department has closed down. You know, 2,000 employees let off in one day or 1,200 employees let off in one day. Um, uh, may have been 2,000. I can't remember at the moment. But uh, there were a lot of people who worked at headquarters that all got laid off at the same time. Some crying. Well, most of them crying. I only know one that was happy. He was a man that worked for Mr. Uh, Helgi, who had been going to law school at night. So when he was let go, he opened up a law <laughs> office and... Well, he was he was kind of happy because he had been working in the law office under Mr. Helge. And, and uh, anyway, that YouTube video uh, shows a red heifer that uh, some people are raising and that they want to offer to Israel just before the setting up of a new temple, a third temple in Jerusalem. Now, there are at least two things that we should know regarding an end-time temple. There may be two end-time temples, one physical and one spiritual. Usually the spiritual is always greater, always more important and more significant than the physical. And even the verse that contains the physical annual and weekly Sabbaths of today and what they mean as being but a shadow of what is actually coming, as recorded in Colossians 2.16. Let me put some, find out where my slides are. Now, to put my slides up, I've got them. I may have to punch around, and I hope we don't lose this media player that's kind of sensitive sometimes when I load a lot of video or slides into it. Um if I have to click around in them very much. But let's see what happens. Oops, it's already hung up. Oh, no, I know why. Because I had that slide toward the end. Now, I want to go to Colossians 2. Just bear with me, friends. I'm just going to click through these. Colossians 2, 16 and 17. Um, and that verse of Scripture that parallels the point that the physical is not as glorious as the spiritual. Let's read it together. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in the respect, how you observe a holy day or the new moon, which we will be observing again after Christ returns, once we're in a civil government that uses the Hebrew calendar, which, you know, we need that for, for observing that new moon. And, uh, you know, right now we're in this temporary in-between time where we're on a pagan Roman government. Or of the Sabbath days. And thankfully the weekly Sabbath has not been changed. They've tried to change the number of days in the weekly Sabbath a few times. Some talk about that, but that hasn't been changed. We still keep the weekly Sabbath. Of course, that's a command that we keep that. So we'd have to figure out how to do it even if man's government or what have you did change the weekly the uh, cycle uh, and the annual Sabbaths, as Mr. Armstrong learned while he was studying that 
and trying to refute his wife. But verse 17 says, let's see, you're going to let me switch to verse 17? Okay, which, all these which are a shadow, these physical things that we do in this life today, the, all these things that are biblical and all, but even, the, even these biblical things that are physical are just a shadow of things to come. And the last part of that verse, it says, but the body is of Christ, but, but it actually should say, you know, who, who can judge us on these things? The body of Christ can judge us on these things. But not, don't let any man do it. But all these, even the physical, biblical things, they're just a shadow of things to come. That's the point I wanted to pull out of that scripture. Um, nonetheless, Please hear me when I say that just because the spiritual is of greater all-time importance and meaning, it does not mean that the lesser, the physical, is without any relevance at all. Because it was a new point that Mr. Armstrong began to make beginning with his sermons on it in and around 1981, Mr. Armstrong began saying that Christ is returning to his end-time spiritual temple, which is us, brethren, you and me. We are the church. As I have said many times, the church is not a, uh, a building. The church is not an organization. But God is making a building out of the church, actually, but a spiritual temple he's making out of it a spiritual building he's not the church is not a physical building um, that's being fitly we are being fitly framed as a spiritual temple as and as a bride for Christ to which he'll return he'll return to a spiritual temple that he'll take as his bride that the father will give away to Christ at a marriage ceremony in heaven and the bride includes all of the spring harvest from Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and King David and all the elect as the spiritual temple to which Christ will return. But there's a need for that lesser physical temple. And some who understand that Christ is returning to his spiritual temple, that being, again, that being us, we being the spiritual temple, some have come to a wrong conclusion, even understanding that, and have even taught that because we now know that Christ is returning to his spiritual temple, some have said that a physical temple is not needed. But um, there's a problem with that kind of reasoning. One is this. Nothing that Mr. Armstrong taught in 1981 or thereabouts contradicts or does away with what he taught in 1967 and 1968 on the subject in a related way, which I'll read to you in a moment. I'll read you the what he taught and wrote in Plain Truth articles in 1967 and 1968 in a, in a few moments. And... Uh, now, I was going to say these things to you before I played Mr. Armstrong's sermon, but, brethren, I pray and ask God before I come on the air every time to guide and lead what I say. And the idea came to my mind very strongly, even though I had pre-written some notes that I had prayed over. The idea came into my head to hold uh, my notes and things I would mention until after I played Mr. Armstrong today. So... I did it that way under inspiration. Um, but in this sermon you heard Mr. Armstrong give, he explained a new understanding that the verses that relate to Christ returning are his returning to a spiritual temple. They refer to Christ returning to his church. And again, that does not do away with the need for a lesser physical temple where the daily sacrifices can and will be reinstituted. And when they stop, the 1,335-day countdown... Let me see if I can find that slide. I, 
where I just put the numbers on the screen for us. Okay, I, uh, I have a way I use during the week for Nightcast to set the things up in the order I want them in. But I, did, I didn't do that today. In fact, I barely, in fact, some of you notice if you tuned in, if you're tuned in live, you know, I was on, I got on late this morning. I made the mistake of taking a phone call from a member before uh, I went on the air this Sabbath morning thinking I, I, I could, you know, keep it short, real short. And it, it was more or less short, but it, it, uh, it threw me off just enough to make me late coming on today. But those of you who watch from the archive, well, that won't make any difference to you. Uh, but for those that watch live, I do try to get on live. Mr. Armstrong set us a wonderful, outstanding example in doing that, and I am I'm going to try my best to make sure we do that from here on. It means I probably won't, I'll just have to ignore any phone calls, brethren, that you make Sabbath morning. Wait and call me after I've been on live or something if you've got to talk to me today. But uh, that temple, that physical temple will affect some of the numbers that we are to watch for. The, it'll affect the 1335. It'll affect, affect the 1290 days. It'll affect the 1260 days. I'll show you how in just a moment. So, but the point, and I'll show you from scripture in just a moment. But the point here is that there is still a need, in spite of the fact that we understand a new understanding that Christ is returning to his spiritual temple, he's not returning to a physical temple, that doesn't negate the fact that there's still a need for a physical temple in the end time. What Mr. Armstrong said in his sermons and the verses of Scripture that he cited in 1967 and 1968 have not been removed from the Bible, and Mr. Armstrong, in his later years, encouraged us to be considering the counting of the 1,335 days, the 1,290 days, and the 1,260 days, which are very much related to an end-time physical temple, these numbers are. Here's what Mr. Armstrong wrote that relates to the need for an end-time physical temple. When he said in a Plain Truth article, let me see if I can find that heading for you on that, friends. If I don't hang this media player up, and if I don't bore you to tears by flipping through all my scriptures till I get to, oh, went the wrong way, went to have gone this way. Bear with me just a moment. We're going to get that title up on the screen. Just so if you want to make a note of it and look this up yourself, you'll be able to do that. It's from the June 1967 Plain Truth article entitled, Jews Take Jerusalem, that I'm referring to here. And in that, in that article, by that title, Mr. Armstrong said, What? is the real significance of the Jews taking Jerusalem. And I'm quoting from a paragraph from this article. He said, the Israelis won a flash war, a blitzkrieg, Israeli style, exclamation point. The news reporters, going on with Mr. Armstrong's quote, the news reporters do not know what it means that the Jews took Jerusalem. But you can know, Mr. Armstrong says in this 1967 Plain Truth article, you can know for there is one of the, for this is one of the major fulfillments of biblical prophecy. There will be, and I'm still reading Mr. Armstrong's writing from 1967, there will be a Jewish temple built in Jerusalem with animal sacrifices once again being offered, end quote. Friends, Christ will not return to this physical temple, but this physical temple, this physical end time temple, a third temple, will serve a purpose especially for brethren to be able to know when to flee those who are accounted worthy for that. Okay, now this brings up another question that uh, 
I wrote to my friend who worked in uh, a, letter answering, a letter answering department, and also he did translation. He worked on, under one of the evangelists for uh, many years, a couple decades in Pasadena. I wrote to him uh, last night and this morning, and I, I mentioned to him, uh, well, there's another question for those who are counted worthy and who will need to know not just when to go, but also where to go. And I haven't heard back from him on that yet. But I, as I said to him, you know, God will, those who are counted worthy to go, he, brethren, will let us know when we're watching when to go. He'll let us know. He'll let us know where <laughs> to go. That won't be a question for those who are counted worthy. Now, there's another article. I mentioned to you, Mr. Article, Mr. Armstrong also wrote regarding this in 1968 Plain Truth article. And that was, uh, as I mentioned, the March 1968 Plain Truth, in which he said, Watch Jerusalem, watch Israel. And I'll quote from further from this article in March 1968. Mr. Armstrong said, quote, The recent Israeli victory gave complete control of the city of Jerusalem, including the original site of Solomon's temple, to the Jews. Now, I'm going to comment on that because I saw that, quote, uh, and others like it, when I, before I went to Israel in the mid to late 70s, and again I went to Israel in the uh, early 80s, and on one of those trips, I don't remember which one exactly, but I very vividly do remember going up to the Temple Mount and having, having read this uh, by Mr. Armstrong saying that, hey, the city of Jerusalem is now under the complete control of the, of the Jews. Well, that's true with certain limitations upon it because um, the Jews kindly acquiesced, and maybe it was after these two writings, but the Jews acquiesced to the Arabs for the area where the Arabs have that uh, Dome of the Rock building with the big old gold, the beautiful gold on the top of it. Uh, that's on that's on that Temple Mount, or what is supposed to be a Temple Mount. Uh, there are some writings that are saying actually the Temple Mount is really somewhere else. Some are saying so. You know there is there is there there are differences of opinion on the Temple Mount. But still, where this Dome of the Rock is, the Jewish people allowed the Arabs to have some dominion over that. And so I'm trotting up to the top of that thing. And these guards, these Arabian guards, come up next to me. And, uh, well, actually, not a whole bunch of them, just one at first. And uh, he was kind but firm. And he says, um, he says, stop, you're under arrest. He says, don't go any further. He says, uh, you're coming on this mount is death under our law to you, death to you. And so I... I had already stopped when he ordered me to stop, you know, and I, uh, and when he said you're under arrest, I'm just thinking, you know, he said, and this is death under our law, and I'm looking around like, hey, where are the Israeli uh, guards or police, you know, I'm thinking, uh, and I'm praying, you know, um, God, what's he going to do if I'm under arrest were his words. If I'm under arrest, is he going to put some cuffs on me and haul me away real quick, and they're going to... How are they going to kill me? And I'm praying, hey, uh, dear God, let me just exit stage left. Let me just turn around and go back the way I came. And he said words to that effect. He said, um, you know, we could kill you for coming on this this because it's death under our law. And um, so uh, I, I forget the exact words, but I was able to I was able to exit. He allowed me to exit, so I just turned around and left. I didn't make any argument <laughs> over that, <laughs> and so, but but that uh, that puzzled me because I had seen these writings about how the Jews were now in charge of the whole Jerusalem, and of course that Temple Mount is a significant part of Jerusalem. 
But uh, anyway, that was an experience I personally had regarding that. But uh, going on, another quote from this 1968 March Plain Truth by Mr. Armstrong. Mr. Armstrong said, The stage is now set for the construction of the temple prophesied in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 4, and Revelation 11, verses 1 and 2. We're going to take a look at those couple of scriptures in just a moment. The prophecy that Mr. Armstrong mentioned in 2 Thessalonians 2, 4, well, let me go ahead and get it up there as I tell you this. Second uh, Thessalonians 2, verse 4. Let's see, they're going to be way at the front. Here we go. Says, let me bring it forward for you, friends. Who opposes him, uh, who opposeth and exalteth, is referring to the Antichrist, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he, this Antichrist, as God, as if he were God, pretending to be God, as if he were an angel of light, sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. That's speaking of a, of a physical antichrist, the end time, last pope of the Roman Catholic Church, sitting in a rebuilt physical temple in Jerusalem. Mr. Armstrong also cited, um, now I was going to cut away to the uh, Mr. Armstrong here, but uh, let's see. He also cited uh, something that I sent to the, in the email to my friend who worked in uh, the letter answering department in Pasadena for years. Um, oh, let's see, I didn't read your Revelation 11 yet. Hold on, before I go to the email, Let's zip down to Revelation 11, verses 1, 2, and 3. Mr. Armstrong mentioned verses 1 and 2, but there's a reason I also want to read you Revelation 11, verse 3. Now, in verse 1 of Revelation 11, it says, God says there through John's writing, And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure, measure the temple of God, and the altar, and them that worship therein. And then verse, verse 2, But the court which is without the temple, leave out, don't measure it, and measure it not, for it's given unto the Gentiles. It, for it is given unto the Gentiles. And the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. Now, of course, brethren, you can easily do the math. Forty and two months, 42 times 30, is the same thing as 1260, 1260 days. And the reason these verses that are talking about the temple and measuring it and the conclusion here being that it's given unto the Gentiles to, uh, along with the holy city that they'll tread underfoot for... 42 months, 1260 days. Uh, I'm just looking at this verse just a moment. That's the main point there is that, that this, uh, the temple and this holy city is given to the Gentiles for the same period of time that the two witnesses, and this is Revelation 11, by the way, is the two witness chapter. So in verse 3, we see a mention of that, and I'll give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days, twelve hundred and sixty days, clothed in sackcloth. And this whole chapter is about the two witnesses. So this this mention in Revelation 11, verses 1 and 2 of the temple uh, being in the hands of the Gentiles and, and that this and that the Antichrist, the Pope, sitting in it as if he were God in that temple for 1260 days is a temple in Jerusalem that doesn't exist at the moment. In other words, meaning that temple has to be built so that the Antichrist can go sit in it. 
And then something happens that tells us to start counting from 1290 days from what happens in that temple that doesn't exist at this moment, in a, in a physical temple. So even though Christ is turning, returning to something greater than a physical temple, he's returning to us, brethren, to a spiritual temple, to his bride, which he'll soon marry right after he returns. That's what he's returning to. That's a bigger, bigger, bigger thing. As and Mr. Armstrong was emphasizing that in a big way. And because some people, because I think when Mr. Armstrong felt people got too carried away when they got, when they would overemphasize things or when he needed to really help us understand a new understanding because we might be hung up with an old understanding. A lot of us understood, as he wrote in 67 and 68, that a physical temple was needed for the stuff. But some have even thought that, well, Mr. Armstrong was emphasizing the spiritual temple so strongly that Mr. Armstrong may have been saying or thought that, well, we, we won't, we, it's not necessary that a physical temple be built. Since Christ is returning to a physical, uh, to a excuse me, since Christ is returning to a spiritual temple, but these scriptures indicate that what Mr. Armstrong wrote in '67 and '68, and perhaps other places too, you could probably research and find even more than I found, and maybe even some later, are not negate are are not negated by what Mr. Armstrong said about Christ returning to a spiritual temple and that being the bigger thing. But those who are counted worthy to escape, Mr. Armstrong also told us to watch the numbers. He told us to study. He didn't tell us he didn't give us a lot of detail on that, but he gave us an instruction that we before, shortly before he died, he gave us an instruction that we should be looking at these 1,335 days, and these 1,290 days, and these 1,260 days, and understand what they mean. Now, Daniel would have liked to have understood, but he didn't explain what they mean. He told us to do that. Daniel would have liked to have understood what all that meant, and Daniel is one of the places where it makes the reference to counting the 1,290 from the time that something happens in that temple that we're supposed to be watching for to happen. And Daniel wanted to know what that meant. And God said, sorry, Daniel, it's shut up until the, it's sealed until the time of the end. And just go your way. You know, of course, Daniel would be dead at the time of the, of the end and waiting for a resurrection. So he wouldn't find out until after the fact, until after it all happened. But the rest of us who are alive, we're not only supposed to know, we're supposed to use that as the timing for when to go when to go to a place of protection and final training, nourishment, safety. And uh, I'll come back to that in a moment. Let's talk about that red heifer for just a moment. My friend who worked for a long time in uh, letter answering and, answering and translating to brethren, letters they would write, wrote me back when I wrote him about the red heifer and said, I'm going to just read you now. I'm reading my friend's writing back to me. And we, he had, we had two writings. He wrote this, I responded to him, and he wrote me again. And I just want you to hear what he's saying, because he took a strong position, and then he softened on it a little bit to say, hey, Steve, because he, I sent him my notes from which I was talking to you I, this, already in this morning, and my notes of other things I'm going to say. I sent those to my friend, and he after, there's a point in this email where he'll say, hey, what you, what you said in your notes are fine. He doesn't disagree with it, but he holds this opinion, quote, that red heifer thing seems to periodically resurface on the Internet. From, and I'm reading my friend's email. He says, from what I remember, there, were at least, uh, there was at least one rancher somewhere in the U.S. who, who t and he's talking years ago, not the recent red heifer, but some many years ago, who a rancher in the United States somewhere who took it upon himself to try to breed the reddest looking heifers he could. And in parenthesis, my friend puts the rancher that, no, that was my note. I put a note inside his email for me when I'm reading this to you. 
the rancher that my friend is referring to is not the one from the most current video on this, but one from some number of years ago. Back to my friend's email, back to me. Quote, my friend says, and if I recall correctly, one of the photos of these red heifers looked like it had been touched up by Photoshop or some other program to make it look even redder. Now, that must have been funny. I would have liked to have seen that just for the fun of it. My friend, though, says in, uh, in his email further, he says, even if the red heifer, even if the red heifer breeding project, the current one he's referring to, is legitimate, could be just a rancher's whim, he puts in parenthesis. It doesn't, even though, but even if it's legitimate, it doesn't seem to have much real prophetic significance, my friend says. And he goes further to say, it sounds like another Jewish tradition, parenthesis, like separating milk and meat foods, and has only a very faint connection to the Old Testament scriptures. So personally, my friend writes, I think that even if there were even if there really is an American rancher getting ready to export several red heifers to the nation of Israel, actually, I should tell my friend, there's only one red heifer as far as I know that was recently born, and it hasn't been photoshopped, the video, it looks like a normal red heifer. I don't, my friend says, I don't think it would amount to a hill of beans as far as prophetic significance is concerned. Now, that's what my friend uh, thinks, although the Jews may, friends, this is me speaking now, although the Jews may do something like that before building an end-time physical temple for animal sacrifices. They might take a red heifer from the United States, even this one that's in the video, and do the purification thing they do um, in ded before dedicating this temple. And... Uh, you know, the temple um, would be for animal sacrifices and would contain an altar inside of it where the abomination of desolation can occur, for which we are to be watching out, you know, looking for that. There may be a lot of ceremony around the rebuilding of a temple in Jerusalem by the Jews, and it may be a glamorous enough building that when the Pope takes over Jerusalem, that Pope will want to sit in that building to give the appearance of himself as God, as the scripture at Second Thessalonians 2.4 indicates, he'll, he'll be want to do where the verse there again says about the man, the Antichrist, the Pope, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God. You know, he's called the vicar of Christ. Or that is worshipped so that he, as God, sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God or showing himself as if he were God. You know, he's in the office, friends, of a God, all right, but that is of the God of this world and not of the great God of heaven. But the great God allows Satan's representative to do this for a time as the false prophet who rides the beast, who ride, rideth the beast. Now, following that email from my friend that I just read to you, who, again, worked directly, who worked in letter answering, who worked directly under an evangelist for many years in Pasadena in letter answering and had other duties translating English articles into other languages, I sent him uh, my notes about what I'm saying to you today to bounce some of my thoughts off my friend. And he wrote back in a second email reply to me as follows. Quote from my friend. The, the note I, the more, he said, the more I think about the red heifer thing, the more it seems to, to border on being a hoax. My friend writing. Nevertheless, he said, I think your comments are fine. And brethren, you know my comments are that, as Mr. Armstrong said in 1967 and 1968, 
there are reasons why an end-time physical temple of some kind or shape in Jerusalem is necessary. Now, some may have said otherwise. And if Mr. Armstrong has said otherwise, I'm not aware of it. But, um, Mr. And I'd like to know, if you've got some specific quote, I'd definitely like to know. God is very capable. Of, God leaves himself a lot of options with some things. He's very capable of working out things in a number of ways. But he told us to watch for when that, when, when there would be, a, when the daily sacrifices begin again. He told us when they stop. And when there's a, an abomination of desolation set up, then we're to know the 1290 days are, have begun. That, you know, how are we going to know the 1,335 days? I'm still studying that subject, and any of you who've got some expert handle on that, I'd love to hear from you. But uh, over in Israel and in Jerusalem, there with, with their enthusiasm, once they're able to do it, and the time is right for signaling us when to escape, it'll probably be the building of a very magnificent structure. They've already setting up building supplies for it and money, plenty of money for that. Uh, now, my longtime Pasadena friend goes on in his email to say, his email reply to me, uh, and, and he discusses with me just a little bit, and I, I can see that he could be right because who knows how God might make what he said we're to watch work out so so that we know it and it so that we know it fulfills what God said needs to be done but my friend said further quote for end time prophecy to be fulfilled I don't think that there has to be a new and rebuilt physical temple in Jerusalem but my friend says I also don't believe that Mr. Armstrong meant parenthesis, unless I misunderstood him in those last sermons, in parenthesis, that under no circumstances would there be a new physical temple in Jerusalem prior to Christ's second coming, end quote. In other words, in spite of Mr. Armstrong's great emphasis on Christ returning to a spiritual temple, I believe you'll understand that my friend is saying that he doesn't believe that Mr. Armstrong totally ruled out the building of a new physical temple in Jerusalem prior to the second coming of Christ. Uh, my friend goes on just a little bit more in his email reply saying, quote, in one of those later sermons or Bible studies, Mr. Armstrong almost, this is my friend's opinion here, uh, Mr. Armstrong almost mocked the idea of the necessity of a physical temple being built. But, as you point out in your notes, he mainly wanted to emphasize the fact that Christ is returning to the spiritual temple, the church, end quote. Just as, friends, and now back to my own comments, just as there is duality in many prophecies, I believe there is some duality in this thing in that I believe, brethren, that, and again, this is me speaking now, not my friend from his email, I believe that there will need to be both a physical temple to signal the spiritual temple when to flee. Now, that brings up another question I mentioned it earlier that I've been meditating on and praying about since World News, and I hope you're watching Nightcast every night, Sunday through Thursday, Thursday night because, wow, world news is showing that the fifth seal could literally s strike overnight at almost any given moment with only days necessary for s some things to just wham together, which could happen out of sight of the news in such a way that by the time you hear of it, it's already happened. It's upon us. The other question that I've been meditating on and praying about is, is, is God supposed, um, I've, I've got this written in my notes in kind of a funny way. Um, 
I think I left out a few words. Well, but the thing I've been meditating on is this, is, you know, God, if God lets us know when to flee, as he says he'll do by, by, by when the daily sacrifices are cut off and when the abomination of desolation is set up, you know, and, and I have to put it this way, in the temple, then we'll know the when to flee. We'll know that at that future moment when that happens, we'll know that, hey, now is the time to flee at some definite time in the future. But the question for the moment is, okay, God, we uh, let's project ahead. Let's say we see this thing happen that says it's time to flee. We say, okay, God, now it's time to flee, but how are we going to know just where to go? Well, brethren, I'm sure that those of us who are accounted worthy to escape will know the voice to follow at that time, whether that be a resurrected voice or some uh, revealed voice of one of the two witnesses that God will be setting up at some future time. Not yet. Some have claimed they've been it or are it or whatever, but that, that hasn't happened yet. Um, but... Uh, when God does do that, the voice that uh, of God may be a resurrected or revealed two end time witnesses, one of them that we'll hear. But however God does it, God will let those who need to know who are accounted worthy to escape, he'll let us know where to go. You can be sure of that. Now, you may want to be sure that your house is ready. God told us decades ago through Mr. Armstrong to prepare to reduce our standard of living. Some of you out there are spending a lot of time daydreaming on your new vacation like ideal dwelling place, whether in a tree house or next to the ocean or wherever, but we all might um, better be cleaning the clutter out of the places where we live now and so that when we go, people who are left behind won't be too aghast at how some of us had allowed clutter to build up around us. And I'm, I'm speaking to myself as I speak to some of you on that. Yea, yea, where the shoe fits, get busy and polish up those shoes, clean out the clutter, and be ready to flee when the word to go comes. Now, brethren, let's go on. Um, I, right here I was going to, I had some notes here saying, let's cut away now to Mr. Armstrong's sermon, but I've already done that. Um, and we heard Mr. Armstrong give the little whispering game that teaches us, you know, we need to be careful when we repeat things that we tell it straight. When you quote the Bible, always be sure to go to the verse. Now, um, I've got some other scriptures I want to go over with you. Um, but that little whispering game gave a... Um, a good moral or a good lesson to it that maybe some of us could learn something from today, some of us adults, even because uh, there are many around today who want to change or modify the things that God taught us through his end-time servant, Mr. Armstrong. And he began where we began in his sermon at the point where Christ was saying, I will build my church. And brethren, God trained ministers under Mr. Armstrong who who Mr. Armstrong did say that the ministers he had trained would cover details that go beyond what he believed he should do in staying with the root and trunk of the tree, the foundation and the rudiments of solid truth that God revealed to and through Mr. Armstrong to give to the rest of us and in so doing show us through whom God was raising up and working uh, in these last days. Mr. Armstrong said numerous times that he wanted the rest of the ministry to build upon and enlighten us from the foundation upwards through a superstructure. And God had corrected things, did he not, by the time Mr. Armstrong died, so that any detail that is added by a trained minister or lay, deacon, or, deacon or layman even to anything God gave us through Mr. Armstrong should not conflict or contradict any of those things which God taught us through Mr. Armstrong. There's, 
there's no rhyme or reason as to why any detail would be such that it would change anything God gave us through Mr. Armstrong because God did not allow Mr. Armstrong to die before he, God, had doctrine set in good order for us. Any detail provided today should complement or supplement what God taught us through Mr. Armstrong, but in no way, shape, or form contradict what Mr. Armstrong, what God gave us through Mr. Armstrong in any way. God is the master engineer of what he's having us to grow in and learn and know. As scripture says, friends, he's the author and finisher of our faith, is he not? As God said through Paul in Hebrews 12, verse 2, I think I have that among the verses of scripture I have for you that I can throw up on, sc on screen before we sign off from today and say so long and see, what did I say? Hebrews 12, verse 2. I think I, I think I got that one for us. Nope, I didn't. I'll just have to, uh, just in mentioning that one, Mr. Armstrong gave us many reasons to understand why it was Paul who wrote Hebrews to the Jews, even though Paul doesn't put his name at the top of it. And part of the reason is because Paul was writing to Jews who hated him. And he wrote in the Hebrew language, not Greek. And the style may have changed a little bit when Luke translated Paul's Hebrew language writing into the Greek language from which we get it in our English translations of the Bible from the Greek manuscripts. But back to what God opened up and revealed to us through Mr. Armstrong, and that verse in Hebrews 12, let's see. Just, I don't have a... I basically t said to you what it says, but let me just read it from the scriptures about Christ being the author and finisher of our faith. Hebrews is just before the book of James. If you want to flip there with me, so I don't have a slide for it. James just before First Peter. Hebrews 12, and I think I said verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured this steros, the stake, the crucifixion post or pole, despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith. So, friends, God is guiding and leading us, and he left doctrine set in good order through Mr. Armstrong. Nothing anybody says, anything that we hear today that we haven't heard before should build on the foundation that God gave us through Mr. Armstrong, a rather large and solid foundation that God has built for us and in us by and through Mr. Armstrong, whom he made a father of sorts for us in the faith. Revelation 3.3, 3, instructing us in the Philadelphia era to re remember how we received and heard. And that's an instruction to Philadelphia, explicitly, specifically, remember, therefore, how you received and heard. We, God let us hear and receive by and through his servant, Mr. Armstrong. He did that for a purpose, to show us who his end time servant and apostle, I was going to say was, but who is. I mean, his recordings we still have as we played from today is as if Mr. Armstrong were speaking from the grave or as if he were still alive because what God said through him is so well preserved for us and available to us. Friends, as, as God opened our minds, he brought Mr. Armstrong before us in writings, publications, and broadcast or in live person and through trained ministers ministers trained under him. That's why here each week on the Sabbath, I try to have Mr. Armstrong speak from the many recordings we have of him more than I speak, but I do speak some. And, and before I do, I always ask God, as I mentioned to you earlier, to guide and lead my mouth and be the source of what I say. 
As David prayed, when I open my mouth, Lord, you speak through it. You fill it. And you should always be hearing what these lips speak. Compliment. That's compliment with an E. And supplement what God has taught us by and through Mr. Armstrong, who encouraged the ministry he trained, to add the details that he strongly felt that that uh, if he were to try and do, it would take away from his job as the overall leader of keeping us well grounded at the trunk of the correct tree. And many of you well know he often taught us there are two trees. And I'm thankful he did, brethren. The one tree, the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, both good and evil on it, as Mr. Armstrong emphasized, but some unwary souls don't see the evil that does exist in and on that tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the other tree, the tree of life to which the elect, the first fruit of God's spring harvest, have been called. But that tree, brethren, that tree of life, has branches and leaves and even twigs on it, and the ministry trained at Ambassador College learned or should have learned the details that God gave us and gave us well. As God says in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 28, I do have these slides for you, friends, that supports what I'm saying, but I'd like to back up and begin with verse 25 of 1 Corinthians, where God says, through Paul's writing to the Corinthians, that, verse 25, there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. You know, brethren, when we see uh, weekly bulletins or, or in any way we find out about brethren who need prayer for this healing or that healing, we should all want to pray for that person and want them to be well like that person wants to be well unless they're fraudulently seeking disability from the United States government and faking an illness or preferring to be ill so they can get money and not have to work but that's a, that's a different story and uh, there are some who are genuinely handicapped and who God withholds healing for a reason and you know we, we, we don't want to we don't want to judge somebody wrongly and we are to encourage and help those who are weak in the faith, even. But, uh, brethren, in verse after verse 25, going on, verse 26, 1 Corinthians 12, And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. You know, brethren, some members are now in need of healing for things they are suffering. Brethren, are we suffering with them? and have the care and concern for them that we should have. You know, and are we watching for things like prayer bulletins? I was producing one for a while. I need to get back on it. I have some people I know, and I want to check with them before I mention their names here. But if I can encourage you to go to the prayer bulletin, if I get an okay from them, I'll try to uh, put that bulletin together with their pictures and a brief mention of what their needs are, and then you can contact them or maybe have enough information from the bulletin to send up their name before God in prayer. And you know, James 5 that instructs us to call for the minister for anointing, that's just part one of what God requires us to do when we want healing. There's part two. Part two, he says, and call upon your brethren. Confess your, your sickness and your need for prayer to your brethren and get a lot of brethren praying for you. That's part two. So you don't, oh, I got anointed. Well, that's not enough. You know, the minister can pray for you and you can be anointed. God hasn't overwhelmingly yet given out a gift of healing, although I do know of a few people who, whose children, when they were injured, uh, asked for an anointing. We sent the cloth, and, uh, and, and uh, from the time they asked for the cloth, a horrible uh, injury just began to be healed like magic. It's like, wow, how could all that heal up so fast like that? Well, God answered that request with a miracle. Uh, 
but there is normally, in the case of a child, maybe God's going to often react quick, more quickly, or in the case of beginning to give out a gift of healing, maybe God's going to start to do things more quickly, but Normally, generally, James 5 is applying where you need to call on your fellow brethren. And because I can't think of the exact wording at the moment, friends, I didn't do a scripture ahead of time on this one. Let me turn to James right after the book of Hebrews. James 5, around verses 14, 15, and just review with you quickly. Verse 16, part 2 of after calling for an anointing, God instructs us, Confess your faults, verse 16. Confess your faults one to another. You know, your sicknesses, your illness, you could say for your faults here. Confess your sickness one to another. You know, sickness and sin, Christ said, whether I say your sins are forgiven or take up your bed and walk, same difference, same thing. And it's not always, sometimes your sickness could be because somebody else sinned. But, you know, if it's forgiven, it's forgiven. Confess your faults, your sickness one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. That's part two. And he goes on to say, in that same verse 16, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. So you want to be sure those you request prayer from are someone God would uh, escheat, consider, deem as a righteous man. Because that will avail much with God. And then, just a couple verses beyond that, God gives the example of Elias, Elijah, being a man subject to like passions as we are. And when they had a drought, he prayed earnestly. Well, first of all, he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by a space of three and a half years. And then verse 18, and he prayed again. After three and a half years of drought, now he wants some water. And, he, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth or fruit. And when you look at the details of, of that, um, back in the Old Testament, um, you'll see that uh, it didn't just rain after Elijah prayed the first time. He prayed a number of times, and after each time he prayed, he'd go look at the clouds and at the sky, and when he'd see no clouds, he went back and prayed earnestly again. And brethren, we should do that for one another. We should check with our friends and say, hey, are you healed yet? You know, no, I'm still, and I had somebody do that for me today. I thank you very much for that. You know, hey, you're still having a problem with your jaw. And I thought, well, yeah, I don't recognizably have a problem with my jaw. Let me touch it and see. And I oh, hey, there's a little pain there, but it's not like it was. There's definitely been some healing and improvement going on there, but there's enough there that tells me, I may need to go ask a dentist what's going on, and I do need some some restoration work where I'm missing a tooth. You know, what do they call that? You know, that just gives you a better appearance so when you smile, you don't have this big hole up there in your mouth where a tooth is missing. And, uh, you know, we've been told that's okay to do, to do, uh, you know, Rest, restore, restore something like that. Although, brethren, if some of you want to know, I've been asking God. I know of somebody who had a tooth, an adult who had an, a missing tooth, regrow. It was a gal. She came to uh, one of my minister friends back in the nineteen late seventies, early eighties, and he was amazed. He told me about this while we were in. I was sitting in his office talking to him one day. He said, "Steve," he says. Uh, I think we were talking about anointings or something. I don't know what we were on. The, he said, uh, so and so a person came to me and asked me to anoint them for a, a missing tooth. And he says, I told him God doesn't do that. And he says, well, I, she said, well, I know he doesn't normally do that. But she said, when you have faith, God moves mountains. He said, that gal came back to him. He said, I, he, well, he said, with the showing that faith, I anointed her for that. He says, she came back a few weeks later, and she showed me. She got all her teeth. <laughs> so, uh, brethren, I'll just mention that to you. And if any of you got a lot of strong faith, and you're effectual and fervent, where God, uh, as uh, where you are a what God would consider a righteous man or woman, then by all means, please pray that God will regrow that tooth for me. I don't have a big budget for a dentist, and it'd be awful nice if God just regrew that missing tooth there. Amen, yay, yay. But I'm not so sure my faith is the same as that gal's. I've asked God a number of times, will you please regrow that tooth for me? You know, I've also asked him to put some hair back on top of this head, but I don't think you see too much. 
So, you know, God, sometimes he his, sometimes his answer is no for whatever reason. You, know, you look good enough without any hair, Steve, to do the job I'm having you do. And maybe there's a reason I want to have you look like sackcloth, uh, sackcloth and ashes. <laughs> um, all right. That just came to my head as a joke, friends. But anyway, uh, uh, when... When a member is sick, brethren, we want to pray for that member and ask God to be merciful and heal them and not let them suffer too long unless he's got them learning something from it. But, you know, ask him to help them them learn it mercifully and, and quickly. But the other holds true, too. When one member, as this verse, the rest of this verse says, when one member uh, be honored, all the members rejoice with that member. And then... Uh, going on next verse let's zip on through these because i don't want to out i want i want my goal is to have mr armstrong usually speak longer than i do and i only played a half hour of him today so i better wrap up here verse 27 now you are the body of christ and members in particular god making the point through paul to the corinthians writing to the corinthians here which is really a writing for us today brethren that we are the body of christ the members of our, and uh, we'll see what happened. There we go. You are the body of Christ and members in particular. And I wanted to uh, go to the next verse here. And God hath set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, governments, diversities of tongues, and, and so on. And the point there is, you know, friends, there are different gifts and different offices even that God gives and that he appoints. And be, I, w I wanted to focus on that part because of God having given different gifts among us. And again, that verse, And God hath set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that, miracles. Now, that's... That's a definite gift. Then gifts of healings. That, and usually that's what most miracles are, gifts of healings. Helps, governments, diversities of tongues. After, And then he asked, and I think I have one more slide, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles? No. There's, there's different gifts, and God's given them out to us, brethren, as, as it pleases him and it, I don't have the slide for it but if you kept going to verse 31 God says but covet earnestly the best gifts you know we should want these gifts and he says and I show unto you a more excellent way now even though I don't have the slide for it having read verse 30 where Paul mentions speaking with tongues let me flip forward a couple of verses in chapter 14 of first Corinthians if you want to go where there with me that's where I'm going first Corinthians Chapter 14, and we're going over to verse, uh, where am I going? Uh, a verse that Mr. Armstrong would emphasize, oh, no, it's going to be verse 10, verses 10 and 11, or explain when mentioning speaking in tongues. No, that's going to make it verses 27 and 28. Um, if any man speak an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or at the most, by three, and that by course, and let one interpret. By course, brethren, means one speaking at a time, not two or three all speaking in a confusing way with a bunch of gibberish at the same time, but one at a time, and at the most three with one interpreting, and God hasn't led that to happen yet. But verse 28 but if there be an interpreter, if, but if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church. Which also God says to the, to the females among us, the lady folk, that they should be silent in the church and ask their husbands at home, or if you don't have a husband, ask a good male friend or, or a minister who you're close to. But uh, if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church and let him speak to him. Some of the women hate that. Man, I see some out there preaching and carrying on like they um, are 
shaped a little differently uh, than uh, than the most females. But uh, if there's no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. Now, I love our sisters, but, you know, God made femininity for a good purpose, and some of you that want to abuse that, he made masculinity to be loving to the females too. So uh, some of you that hate the fact that you got to be feminine or should be feminine, you are bashing the a quality that God gave the males to be the head and you know and for you to look to them and for you to keep that femininity it's a beautiful thing even for you and if you wound up being a female when you wanted to would have preferred to have been a male well I'm sorry that's your lot in life you know transvestites are not going to be entering God's kingdom and I was putting it kind of strongly, but, if you know, sometimes we want things we don't have and we have to submit ourselves. You know, Christ would have loved to have ended the, the night before the crucifixion and had it come out and play out a totally different way. He said, God, it, isn't there some way this cup could pass from me? And after a little prayer with God, he said, nevertheless, not my will be done, yours be done. When he real, And when he realized that, you know, look, Ain't no other way. This is the way. This has got to play out. I got to get on that crucifixion stake and die, bleed to death, and suffer and die. But brethren, thankfully, God has not provided any interpreters for what might become a bunch of craziness. Now, you know, if He does that in the future, there's a instruction here about how it's to be done. Uh, now, there are many of us who can interpret what the apostates have done just as, uh, as as just nonsensical double talk and a return to the vomit from which God pulled out many of us when he called us. Many of us came from backgrounds. Did I read verses 27 and 28 to you or in verse 10? Ah, I wanted to ultimately go to verse 10. Let me get 1 Corinthians open back open again. And um, I remember, brethren, I prayed and asked God that when I opened my mouth for him to fill it, if you're watching live, you can do the same thing while you're sitting there. You can ask them to either have me cool down or, you know, or go with a certain thought or whatever. But many of us came from backgrounds of Protestant this or that, from which, as God opened our minds, we could see that that all that was a lie and doesn't make good sense even once a person's mind is opened up by God's removing the blinders, the, the veil from our eyes which allows Satan to deceive man. The apostates have gone back asswards into vomit. How's that for an interpretation of some of today's modern double talk and gibberish from some we once thought were of the faith that God delivered to the saints through his most faithful servant and apostle of the end time, Mr. Herbert W. Armstrong. And Mr. Herbert W., I'm speaking of Mr. Armstrong, who would often encourage us, as God said through Paul back in the first chapter of 1 Corinthians in verses 10 and 11. But in going back, let's begin with verse 5 of 1 Corinthians. And then, I'm in the wrong chapter, excuse me, friends. Let's begin with verse 5, and then we'll focus on verse 10 and also on verse 7 as we get to each of those verses. First, verse 5, that in everything you are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge. Verse 6, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that, verse 7, you come behind in no gift. That you come behind in no gift. God wants us to have gifts, brethren, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, verse 8, shall also confirm you unto the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 9, God is faithful by whom you were called unto the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which is now coming a lot sooner than later. Now, verse 10. That This verse 10 that Mr. Armstrong often punched as those being trained in the minist 
to, to, to you know to uh, at those being trained in the ministry, and we'll all we, we are all being trained, brethren, are we not, to be ministers, priests, and kings, reigning and ruling with Christ on His throne, with Him from Jerusalem and around the world as His bride. Now, verse ten, I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all, I was hoping I had that verse on the screen, but unfortunately I don't. But that, brethren, I beseech you by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, in the authority of Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing. Let's read that part again, brethren, beginning, the beginning of verse 10. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, with all the authority of Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing. And, and what? And that there be no division among you, but that you be perfectly joined together, united and living in a Philadelphia era, in a worldwide association. Is all that being perfectly joined together? I just have a question <laughs> I wanted to throw in there. Humorously, maybe. All, you know, um, a lot of separate corporations going on. But brethren were to be in the same mind and in the same judgment. Just a question I inserted in, in there for fun and possible edification for that verse. Verse 11, For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now, verse 12, This I say, that every one of you saith, I'm of Paul, and I'm of Apollos, and I'm of Cephas, I'm of Roderick, I'm of those who vote, I'm of this or that minister, and I'm of Christ. Next verse, verse 13, Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Repeating verse 10, and then, let's, let's, uh, let me start to wrap up. Now, I beseech you, brethren, that by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Um, all right, friends, we heard Mr. Armstrong today speaking from Big Sandy, giving a new understanding on we, us, God's elect, God's first fruit, his springtime harvest, being the temple of God that Christ would return to. We are the temple, as you heard Mr. Armstrong speak. Friends, I'm going to leave it right there for today. Thank you for joining me here for this Sabbath service on the internet via cogtv.org and the sabbathservice.tv channel. And I'm going to wish you a good week. Hope you'll join us during the week for Nightcast, the day's current news from the world related to the Bible and prophecy in a half hour, usually a half hour, sometimes longer. I did three 45, 47-minute programs last week because just a lot of stuff. But when it's not too heavy, I'll compress it down to a half-hour program Sunday through Thursday night on nightcast, night-cast.tv, um, available from the cogtv.org uh, channel. And uh, I wish you a good week. I hope you'll join us for Nightcast. And uh, those of you who will be back with us next Sabbath, we'll plan to be here and try to be our best to be on time here for services from... Uh, cogtv.org. I'm looking for a screen I could uh, sign off with, and I think I have one over here. If you'll bear with me for a moment, I'll just put up a slide that says, uh, join us again next week. I think that's the one that'll pop up here. Yeah, okay. Brother, and I, brother and I'll just uh, say so long with that. Happy Sabbath. Thanks for joining me here today.